Here. Andrew Daniels here and Sarah Lark. Here. All right, next up on the agenda, approval of minutes from our April 9th, 2024 meeting. Do I have a motion? Second. Good. So any discussion on this? All right, hearing now, let's vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? All right, motion passes. Number three, public advisory be heard. I do not see anyone. Number four, organizational updates, advisory board interview schedule. All right, so uh, the period for applications closed April 26th. Um, and we have, there's a summary in your packet of the terms that we are going to be um, interviewing and selecting people for, but Big Tom needs to. Uh, yeah, um, just to let you all know, I did not reapply, so June will be my last meeting. Um, I thoroughly really enjoyed being on the advisory committee and the, and the commission at the time. Um, and I, I think it's in great hands now, and we'll do good things in the future. I am personally sad and disappointed, <laughs> but. <laughs> Not in you. I'm not not disappointed you. for this for team, us. for us to be missing you, etc. You know what I mean. Um, so that means we'll be filling. That's why that what we've got on here is three regular member terms ending June 30th, 2027. One unexpired regular member term ending June 30th, 2025. So that was the one that Lauren vacated. Um, so four spots, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven candidates, which is amazing. Um, most other city boards and commissions are not that lucky to have that many applicants interested, so that's really great, at least in the history. I'm not sure about this, but last time it was a struggle. Um, <coughs> that does include Glenn and Carrie in, the, in that eleven. And just to note that. Uh, the Board of Commission has decided not to interview existing members that are reapplying, just interviewing the new members, potential new members. Um, so the uh, City Council, which is the Board of Commissioners for LHA, they'll be doing interviews in June on a Saturday, but that means this group needs to select two people to conduct the interviews, and um, that needs to happen by June 5th in order to be ready in time for the Board of Commissioner interviews which I think are June 15th or something. Um, and so then we would, the LHA board would then appoint those members, should be after that point, if they do it in a board meeting, I don't recall what we did last time, but it should be then at the July board meeting, I would assume. Potentially June, actually, because I think June is the June meeting, on the 18th. Okay, gotcha, great. Okay, um, I would also note that Last time when we were selecting who would have which term, it was random, and that did mean that in this case, Tom was selected just for a one year, which is, it's awkward, but it's, you know, it is part of the process. If you do, uh, this group can either choose a random selection again, or strategically direct that more um, based on the applicants. So that's a choice of yours. Um, so first we would need two volunteers, I know Arlene has done it in the past, so we she could, also told me she wanted to, she do, wanted to do it again. Yeah. Okay, so then we need one volunteer that can't be Glenn or Carrie um, to assist, and then we need to talk to schedule as well. Sounds <coughs> good. Okay. Well, this the Saturday is the one where the board of commissioners would do it. You don't have to be there for that. Um, Typically what we've done in the past is we've set it for a weekday because you'll have a couple staff members assist and sit in as well. Um, so it's kind of an open book on a weekday. Maybe we could start an email conversation with Arlene to set a day. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Is there anything else that we got covered? Well, then one more thing in June, we're going to have to then go for your chair as well. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So that will be... 
that might have to be the July advisory board meeting because I think the June advisory board meeting would be before the interviews. Because it's the second Tuesday. Midway. Just our lean then just for side over then the July Okay. Yes, because the advisory board meeting is June eleventh. Board applicant interviews with the, with the board are the fifteenth. So it would have to be just come in on that July meeting and have uh, Arlene act as the the vice. Make sure the so, public are invited to be heard. Please. Yeah. I bet you will. <laughs> okay. Um, just a couple things of note. Um, I do I do recognize a couple of names on here. There is an asterisk on here. There is one member that is currently on the Human Health, Housing and Human Services Advisory Board, just to note that, but that's okay because it's not serving city council, so it's okay to double up. Um, so I think I'm excited about this. It looks like we have a good number of people, and I haven't seen any applications yet, but I do recognize a couple of names just from industry work, so that's exciting. Okay, any questions about that? So going back to the um, term that expires in 2025, you said we would just, we could either identify somebody ahead of time or just randomly assign. So, uh, so one of the- After interviews, I guess. After the interviews, okay. Um, so that, that'd be the choice, whether you make it random or select. From my understanding, uh, once is like uh, one year and they get selected once again, Whatever term they were already assigned to, that's the same term that they would serve the following. So then that means they so wouldn't they, they wouldn't continue. they wouldn't be serving like Lawrence, if that makes sense. So they wouldn't fill Lawrence, which is the twenty twenty five, right? So it would just be a new three year situation. Right. Oh, okay. So it would be one of the new folks that gets it would, the yes. twenty five that is expiration of the one year term basically. Yeah. That makes it more clear. If we were in a the reason we had to do that last time must have been different. Then. The reason why we had to do that last time is because it went from um, five to seven. Yeah. seven. Yeah. So it added four members. So they had to okay. Do that. Yeah. that is better. <laughs> oh, also, any questions on the interviews? Questions? Oh, that? right. So these are the same interview questions we used last time. And so if you have any feedback for modifications, if there's anything missing, we do have the opportunity to do that ahead. Developing project updates? Uh, so, um, for development, we've got village under construction. I think we talked about this last time here. We're getting to the, we're in heavy construction now. You walk in, the, uh, there's scaffolding and <laughs> plastic everywhere in the lobby. There's a tunnel to maintain access to the front door, but it is loud. Um, it, it is it is impactful right now. So of all the times in the whole construction period, the next month or so is going to be the most intense. Um, and so we're trying to make sure we uh, get responses to resident questions as quick as we can. Um, we are holding every copy and conversations at Village from here through construction will just be an open forum for construction questions. So the next one's on Monday. Um, so we'll be there and ready for that. Um, we're about to show the residents the well they've seen the they've seen the furniture options um, and I think we're having swatches and such at the next meeting as well if I recall so hopefully that's an exciting part for the residents but I also expect to, to get back to the um, um, but we are moving on schedule the moves are on schedule I think we got our we just finished the third wing so we're part way through the res the unit turns um, and so I think we've really got it down at this point of what the expectations are for the units when when he heard how they leave them um, the workmanship has been great there's just been things because we've done punch list walks and then they have time for corrections and then residents move in there were some things that that they didn't 
complete. There was just still some items that we had identified that weren't yet done. And what we really were trying to do is minimize going back in 2007 students. So we're trying, I think we've gotten that dialed in by now, which is good. Um, so, and we've got property management and maintenance also doing their own punch list walk to, and they've got a checklist running to make sure they get everything that they have in mind addressed as well. Uh, we're getting ready to do some samples, brick stain samples on the exterior. So we'll start to see what it looks like on the outside and they're prepping to do exterior work probably starting in June. Um, and getting that moving. Parking, the parking lot will get closed for a period of about three weeks. And so we're working to see if residents can temporarily park at the spoke parking garage. So we're working with LDBA and, and BCHA to get that arranged. Um, of course, Coffin Street is also in rough shape at the moment. I should say it's not, it's in this case, sorry. Um, it just, uh, Excel is moving gas lines right now, so it's all torn up, but um, it is officially open for access. So it's, we knew that there was gonna be some construction overlap, so we're just making the best of it. Um, so everything is moving as it's supposed to. Construction is tough, uh, but right now we're also we have a pretty healthy contingency budget on this one because it's a big project and so we're making calls right now on what what's our wish list items for um, ways to use up that contingency I'm that through. what about like disability parking on that uh, with the parking lot shut down are they still going to have to go over the spoke in that or is there going to be something for the center for people with disabilities well no i'm just saying the is, well is there any uh of our residents that use the disability parking is there yes. going to be some Close that we can access, yes. or is it? And so what? What I would like to do is, I mean, it's very easy to coordinate this with the city. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to do is try and um, can't necessarily reserve an ADA, but the turnaround mm -hmm. area that is public parking, and I feel like we could try and talk to LDDA about making some priority parking there for ADA use, but I don't. I don't know if you're allowed to reserve ADA parking. They're not right. So let me, let me look into that a little closer because you're right, spoke parking would not be it's ideal, not ideal for that. But yeah. right. mm -hmm. So, I'm just going to make a break note for myself. Any other questions about the Done with construction here in end of September. Um, Ascent. The big news is we got the Early Childhood Education Center fully funded, which is so Yay. exciting. <laughs> we, it, it, even as of February, it was, I, we set so many balls up in the air still. I really hope this comes together. Um, and it did. So, and we still have, that's before we even, like, Longmont Community Foundation wanted to get involved in this as well. <coughs> and we fully funded it before they had a chance. So they are now, we're kind of switching gears and they're gonna be working with Wild Plum Center to help furnish and get all the, there's, there's a lot more to do still. It's not just building the shell. There's a lot of stuff to put in the building in the ECE. So they're gonna be working with Wild Plum to support them in getting all of their um, fixtures and equipment and that type of thing. So it's happening. Where was the funding come through? We got $2 million from the Colorado Health Foundation, which is wild and so great. We had $350,000 for Boulder County Sustainability, which is kind of serving the whole thing, but that's where the, the gap that needs to be filled. Um, we have $150,000 from Boulder County Worthy Costs, $525,000 from the city using our ARPA funds. So it was, it. I, I put together a summary for the board a while back still feel like it was these. Um, we asked for $9 million, and it took over a year and a half or so to get to the three million mark. So early, funding for early childhood education is few and far between. It's crazy. Yeah, it's a priority. It's a priority, but there's like there's nothing out there. Um, certainly nothing. We attempted, we applied for state funding. We didn't get anything. We just declined. Um, just crazy to me but thank goodness the Colorado Health Foundation they funded it because they specifically want affordable housing 
with a direct tie to early childhood education daycare. So, thank goodness. So exciting. Um, so, we are speeding along to closing now. We're, it's getting intense, which is typical. Um, the projected closing is mid-July. And so we'll be doing a lot of work between now and then to get to that point, and construction will start soon after that. Any questions on that? Other than that, we've got stuff in the hopper, but this is really our, in the last, since May 2022, when we closed on Christmas, I guess June 2022, um, we had Christmas close and start construction, which they are um, cutting their ribbon on in June. Actually, we should make sure that you're included on that. Um, and then we had Zinnia come along within a year after that. And Zinnia will, is going to finish construction early in September. So we'll be opening that up. They're, we're starting lease up already. And that will be um, open in October. And then moved into Village <coughs> six months later. And so that's ongoing. And then Ascent here another six months later. It's been for a small organization with a small development team, that's pretty wild to have four projects in two years. Um, so it's very exciting. It's a ton of work. And from now on, after we get through Ascent closing and Village construction completed, we're working on the next phase, but it's a little bit further out where we're, we're still in pre-development on some stuff. Um, the Atwood project that we're just partnering on, they're going to reapply for tax credits in November, well in August, find out by November. So we're assisting on that. Um, so hopefully that would get the funding award and then we have another one that's close to construction. And then we've got some land to figure out. Uh, we've got the Royal Mobile Home Park that we have to just time out in our in our projection schedule. And we have potentially by the end of the year, and this is all still on the city side, the Royal Home Home Park is still a quite city, but it's dedicated for affordable housing. And then um, by the end of the year, we might have a land donation through the city's inclusionary housing program um, up on 19th and Terry. So we'll see that in the year if that's gonna be finalized. And so we gotta plan out the next couple of years including a potential middle income project that's, that's also in development. So there's still a lot of time. I think that's my main updates on development. Any Any questions? updates on Zinnia too, or? I'm sorry? Any updates on Zinnia, is that just moving along? Zinnia's just moving along. Mm -hmm. It's ahead of schedule on construction. We're working on lease up. We're doing a lot of uh, sessions with a PSH, Permanent Support and Housing Consultant, that Element has hired to help them you know, design the project and now implement. And so between Boulder Shelter, Mental Health Partners, Bo Simone Consulting, PSH Consultant, Element, and us, we're meeting every week to go over to finalize our tenant selection plan, get on the same page about procedures and um, how, you know, this is the first time that LHA has managed a project that it doesn't have ownership interest in. And so, it's different. It's definitely different. We are not making the calls on some of the elements that we are used to making the calls on. Um, for example, you know, if if a unit ends up meth contaminated, that's it, it's not our financial responsibility. We are a key player in figuring out what to do, but it's just a different element. So we're making sure that everybody gets on the same page before we get started. We want to all be aligned, and so that's what we're working on heavily right now. You know, who's going to be managing it, the weakness and stuff like that, or will they Boulder be? Shelter. Okay. So half of the tenants will come through the local coordinated entry, Exit Income Homelessness. Half of them will come from the statewide one home list. Um, and so it will be a combo of people with local ties and some living on them. And then on um, LHA's website, or just have, like, if you want an additional resources or weakness, here's the just pointing to that. So there is no wait list. There's no wait list because they're pulling from these okay. specific people that are going through this exiting homeless right. process. Right. Right. So I think we will certainly have something on our website um, announcing it and, and and telling people if you're interested, this is where who, go, who to go talk to. But it's going to be based on specific, not qualifications, but specific circumstances that you're in. Okay. 
Are the mental health partners, are they going to have their own feed in as well, or is it mainly through? It's going to be different. Mm -hmm. Nope, mental health partners will, will not be doing, Boulder Shelter will be pulling all the references for people. Well, the mental health partners is just going to administer the vouchers. They're not, it's going to be a different role than at the suites. Um, they are just whoever Boulder Shelter brings in, then LHA will do our screen for tenancy, and then MHP will come in last. And they have very minimal screen at that point um, based on the requirements around the funding for those vouchers, which is state funding. There's, they don't have as many strings attached as at the suites. Um, and so it'll primarily be Boulder Shelter doing the first pass, LHA doing the second pass. Will the Boulder Shelter have case managers and all that? Yep, they're providing supportive services. This is this is the model for how PSH is supposed to be structured and funding structured, which the suites is a very old model. And so this, we have services funded for five years within the project budget, and then at the five year mark, the city's human service agency funding has made a commitment to help fund it, but it will be Boulder Shelter performing some resources on site. We'll have people on site during business hours every day. Which is good. On that note, one of the hard parts for us is sorting through how the suites and Zinnia are different because they have totally different funding structures and different requirements that go along with that. Um, but what we are doing is we've got the we've been interviewing for the three clinicians that we're going to post at the suites, and so we're very close to having people on site. Um, we have a new community manager there, Jana, who has a ton of experience in, in property management, especially with the um, the populations that we see at the suites. Um, and then we're we've posted for an assistant community manager as well because once we have both properties we'll have John um, be the manager for both and an assistant so we'll have added capacity um, and we want that assistant on board before we lease up so they can assist in that process so we've got one position out there three clinicians also out there but in interviews and we're about to have a very robust staff of the suites which is really exciting compared to the history, the long history of the suites being constantly under resource. So we're we gonna have security that we the mm -hmm. suites. Yep. Same schedule. Yeah, they're they're on our existing contract. So Zinnia is covered under our contract right now for walkthroughs of the construction site mm -hmm. um, overnight. But when they get their temporary certificate of occupancy, that's gonna drop off our contract and then Zinnia will have to the project will they contract with the security company for 24 hours security front desk. So it'll be, it won't be under LHA's contract anymore because the property itself will need to care of that cost. So that'll save us. I mean, they're paying for that service. They're getting invoiced for the construction walkers right now. So yeah, that'll be 24 hours security. Well, then you mentioned the, the screening process. There's three different levels of screening. Is that just paper or is a, is a person having to go through the interviews with the three different agencies? It's paper. Paper. Mm -hmm. So what, we're still sorting out exactly what it'll be. Um, but what it might look like is Boulder Shelter confirms that they qualify as, you know, they, they meet the definition of homelessness that is attached to these, this funding source, which is a whole thing in and of itself. There's multiple definitions of homelessness. And so they will make sure of that. And then we will come in and what we are still negotiating, but what we are hoping for is we perform a criminal background check. Um, whether we look at rental history is still being talked about, um, but we will at least confirm that for tenancy, you know, it's a low barrier to entry, that's the point, but um, that there isn't something that is a major, major concern before they're a tenant. And then MHP just, they have to do a very minimal screening process to go back to So for the criminal history check, uh, are there specific, you know, like crimes or violations that we're just saying like, no, like, you know, more violent crimes? Um, I guess we'll do our first question. And then the second is, so, so we're the ones, like the, the LHA is doing that, the background checks, right? Not the open yeah. check. Yeah. So, um, who actually goes to this check? Yes, our it is our property management team. 
I think we're we're looking at ways right now. It's like, does that make sense? Should it be at the regional property manager level? Could we have it better? Could we make the process better? We're looking at all that. We're also trying to get a new background check company, which is shockingly a really big challenge <laughs> to get one that that pulls the information that you're actually wanting. So. So just to give a, I mean, this is all still in draft form in negotiation. Um, but the hard stops at this point are um, if you've been convicted of a drug-related criminal activity for manufacture, production, distribution. Um, I think we're still talking about what how possession plays in, but certainly those uh, basically making meth or selling meth. Within what time? Seven years? Five. Five. Five years. And it has to be a conviction. It has to be a conviction. conviction. It cannot be just an arrest. And it's any drug, right? Not just meth? Or is it the really Schedule one drugs. Schedule one drugs. Okay. So meth. I mean. I mean, which weed stuff. still is, we right? Marijuana. Well, it's still considered federally schedule one, but we'll right. see what plays out. Um, marijuana is looked at differently. Yeah, I know. Someone wants it to go, but um, okay. Um, if if someone, this is also a draft where we're at. If someone has been, ever been evicted for reasons related to meth, they will be automatically denied, but you can appeal because we do want to take into account if someone's gotten treatment or there are lots of circumstances that might come into play. Um, and then it's a and then if you're a lifetime registered sex offender. Not necessarily not lifetime, which is how the suites is right now too. Um, so those are the, the big ones so far. And the difference with this property is that these state housing vouchers, they're not federally funded. Um, and so they're balancing trying to make the state happy. Right. And they'll take a lot more if they're willing to accept yeah. like more. And we are trying to present ourselves too. So we're having those elevators. <coughs> Federal funding brings in more limitations, and that is what the yeah. suite is operating under. The uh, application <coughs> process, I assume, is going to be done by the project manager, by Lisa's group. Which process? Eviction. Yes. And is there a special consideration under that, since this is the exit for homelessness? So it's the same as the suites, in terms of it is permanent supportive housing, meaning you are supposed to be, it is not, you balance fair housing rule, federal fair housing, with the fact that it's permanent supportive housing and there is a um, leniency there for certain lease violations because it is understood that people are going to make mistakes because they are trying to get their life back on track and sometimes they're um, coming from either challenging situations related. There's, there could be a myriad. And they're either in recovery or coming from a tough financial situation or there's a lot of reasons. So what can yes. get your victim in the spring creek and not be the same? Yes, correct. These are high acuity of need populations generally. And we know that um, they're the, at the highest risk of being chronically homeless. And so when you do a permanent school of housing development, you are accepting that you are attempting to help the hardest to house. And so it has a different threshold. It's a really tough line too. So we're talking to Zinnia about Zinnia, Element about that. It's really up to them. They are the owners. I think they're, we went through this process two years ago where we talked to legal to say what's our risk factors here, they're going through that process now. So it's nothing we didn't do. Um, we came to the conclusion that the, the risk was low if you take, you know, go down a certain path with it and use it in a certain way. So we'll wait and see. I hope so. It's also a financial commitment that they didn't really plan for. So, but it's part of their risk tolerance. So we'll see if they Probably so that one, is, one or two units would cover the whole property. Yeah. Right? yeah. Right. Easy. And you're going to have that. I know. So what something we're trying to do with the whole group is what do you see in your day-to-day -day work? 
the Boulder Shelter works with the people at a, a personal level. They see what goes on. They don't necessarily know what a meth impacted unit, what the impact of that is. So, and Element doesn't either. Element has done Bluebird. It's been open since January, which is a sister project to this one in Boulder. Um, and so they're, they're seeing how things work and how they go in PSH. Um, and so we're just trying to get into this relationship building phase where everyone kind of understands where are you coming from? What do you see every day that, that makes you take this stance on something? So we're in the midst of that right now. Because I don't think that we need to, we've historically been very transparent and vocal about what the meth impacts are. But if you're, if you're a case manager, either from MHP, Boulder Shelter, and you're working even at Hope, working with people directly, they don't necessarily know what we're dealing with with the meth unit. So I'm trying to say, you know, a single smoking in a unit one time could be $5,000 cleaning, like minimum. And they don't even, they don't realize that. They don't hear that part. They see one phase of it, and we see one phase of it, and we gotta make sure everybody knows what's going on across the board. Because uh, it's just how you, and it, it can impact how you talk to your clients about it. Like they have expressed, like when they know someone is using methyl they're saying, you're being a real jerk here. Like this is, this is not cool. And I go, yes, and. $250,000. Like, that's more than not cool. <laughs> so, um, it's just information sharing and storytelling about what actually happens in this world so that everyone's going in, eyes wide open, and has a plan for how to handle it that we're all on board with. So, that's where we're getting. Now, my understanding is that we have some special applications. Uh, we are no longer a money maker for an insurance company. Just out of curiosity, Element is separate though, right? So they could, it's part of their decision making process. They could. They also don't have insurance for it. Nobody does anymore. They just no don't, right? Yeah. They don't yeah. offer so, um, so that's it's part of their response. Yeah. And so we're just trying to share information about our experience so they know what they're getting into and what how to plan for it because it's not just the two hundred fifty thousand dollars it's plus a year of a unit not generating income which then the investors are impacted by and so it's a big it's, it's a challenge to house people and you have all these down units exactly and then you really see the purpose of yeah Right. Yep. I mean, so it plays to all of the elements. It plays to, you know, the mission. It plays to the finances. It plays to the tax credit program and how that works with PSH. It's really, really, really complicated. Does it feel like there you don't understand the seriousness, or is it just still you're trying to get them to understand? Trying to get them to understand. I think they nobody. We have been generally on the same page about math. It's just making sure that everyone knows eyes wide open when we, when the inevitable day comes that we have a tenant that we know has used math in the unit, what have we approach it, what do we do? So that we're all on the same page. It just seems important that you want them to address it, not just on like a, or think about approaching it, not just on a personal level. Like I get that that's what they're doing, they're interacting mm -hmm. with just, you know, trying to figure out the best thing for this person in recovery, but yeah, I, that, that's sort of, what I was thinking, like we know that they don't take it seriously. It's just not the lens in which they view, like the like, mission of their right. work. I guess I don't. I don't know, but I yeah. think that that could be problematic. They're worried about the individual, not the view. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Which I get because their life's work is to house this person that is hard to house, mm -hmm. and if. They are unsuccessful and they come, they're just coming back straight into their, they're always you know, rotating in and out and having to fulfill that mission with that person again. And so that is a, there is no right answer to all of this. There's give and take and picking the line that, that meets everybody's goals the best. PSH is very hard, very hard. I don't even think that we've had this conversation. We don't think that even low income housing tax credit programs don't work with PSH. Like, if you have to have a unit 
uh, rent ready, if not filled or rent ready by the December of each year to get the tax credits on the unit for the next year. If you have a meth unit, what are you supposed to do with that? You can't lose the tax credits on PSH. That is going to kill the project. And it, it is a And if you don't have investors, how do you build PSH? And then you have to keep the investors happy, or else the projects that it's a, you have to have be financially successful. So, problem of our age that I don't know if we'll solve in our lifetimes all the way, but we'll do our best, <laughs> one step at a time. All right. So let's go on to item six items for input to the uh, LHA board of commissioners. Suites land option. Off here. Um, I just wanted to circle back on this because we brought the conversation up to the LHA board very briefly. Um, I did agree last time Arlene specifically had asked to have kind of a blurb of the options, which I have not prepared fully yet, but I thought I would just talk about um, the options that the board were, was discussing. Um, and then we're not making any calls on this anytime extraordinarily soon, uh, but I just wanted to circle back to you with what they uh, mentioned. So it's going to take me a quick second here to pull up our <coughs> Sorry, you see the sausage making here. why you pull this up before the meeting. The other nine pages. Reminder of the land that we're talking about. Back side suites. All right. So it's this proposed building in orange, is a give or take 63 units. Um, so what the board talked about at their last meeting when we were just brainstorming. Uh, but some of the options that came up is first when the, we took the LHA board members about a year and a half or so ago, took them down to Denver to do a tour of Arroyo Village, which is a tax credit project that has a small shelter, date of just overnight shelter, attached to PSH units, attached to traditional affordable housing. And they really tacked on to the idea that um, if you could have that all in one place and show the graduation from one to the next, it offers hope for the people entering that shelter that they could do what they are seeing right next door. Um, that was a really cool project and they were in a qualified census tract, which meant that they got the shelter covered by tax credits in, within basis, which is really a critical funding mechanism because funding for shelters is not just lying around out there. And Longmont does not have a permanent shelter. Um, Boulder Shelter officially serves Longmont, but a lot of Longmont folks do not want to go down to Boulder. It's, it's too far. Um, Hope does operate, and some others operate emergency shelters around, um, but we do not have a permanent shelter. So that is something, you know, with a city of 100,000 without a shelter, there is a case to be made for, for having one. Now, there's a lot more. There's a lot more behind that that comes through the HSBC and the regional partnerships and the homeless um, services side of things. But generally that was attractive to several members of the board. The problem though is we're not in the qualified census tract. So this shelter could not get funded at this site if we did something like that. Um, so there, there's this big financial challenge on this one for that type of option. But that was still something that specifically the mayor um, has had in mind since that tour. Um, we talked about doing traditional affordable housing back there, and that was really just to balance out um, 
the population concentration. And then um, the last target population that came up that we had at least four members in support of looking into was targeting youth. Um, those aging out of foster care, there is the group together um, focuses on youth homelessness or youth exiting foster care, a lot of just targeting that area. And they just opened something really cool in downtown Denver that Penrose, who's our development partner on Ascent, they, Penrose and together, did a project right down there by Coors Field that is um, targeted towards youth. And it's just, it's just really cool. Um, some of the reasons we don't, A, that's a population that's underserved here, and B, there was some comments made about how they might be a little more resilient to the uh, being on site with 130 or so units of permanent supportive housing. Um, but there are opinions all over the place. It could be they're definitely resilient to and more willing, I should say, if you have some traditional affordable housing, the marketing next to permanent supportive housing, whether we want to say that's real or not, it's real. There might be um, a harder time attracting families because there's 130 units from the supportive housing next door. Just to be real, when our market studies would show this eventually. Um, but the idea was that youth might be more resilient to that idea. There's also the other side that youth might be susceptible to influence and we're trying to, to not concentrate too much without doing it extremely well. And so there's there's a toss up of whether that is the right target population for this area. Either way, across the board, um, service center, life skills, bringing services to that site is a huge priority. So we could certainly do that if we did services on the bottom and uh, units on the top that could serve the whole campus. That's very desirable from everyone. And we've already uh, also talked about um, city facilities there, like housing and human services, even for nonprofits in the public sector in this area are all challenged for space. Um, so if we could bring a presence on site that is in that service realm, but also serve some city need, that also might be a way to bring in more funding to do it. Um, and the ultimate backup, which which we didn't necessarily dig into this with the board, but the ultimate backup is if we can't find a target population that we think works, maybe maybe it's a service center, completely service it's related. That's the, the end all be all backup plan if we can't figure out the target population. So I just wanted to get feedback on that to for when later when we do actually end up making a call. And again, this one is also subject to element because they have the option on this land and if they are still interested they need to start making moves they may there's a chance they would let the option expire we don't we can't really tell um but if they don't if they want to take advantage of the option then they have to start prepping for a tax credit application pretty soon if they're going to go for a nine percent that'd be february 25 and so they have to start making plans so is there any reactions to some of those um, brainstorming ideas from the board? Well, I think in the past you said in order to be viewed more favorably from CHAPA, you've got to have some incorporation in services. Oh, yeah. Right? So yeah, that's, that's a given regardless of the target mm -hmm. population rate. Mm -hmm. So what, you mentioned a qualified census track. Is that what, what it was? Yeah. And this isn't qualified or... No, so we get from Britain though. They do, but this 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 area will have to be it. This one. So commercial. What is what is so frustrating about qualified census tracts is they are population based, so income based, I should say, based on population. So they do shift. HUD change, HUD, HUD sets the qualified census tracts. They do change every year. Um, so we've had like a North Main area. We've had some tracks go in and out of a qualified census tract. Um, generally, most of our qualified census tracts are focused on North Main and just East of Main. Everything on the outside has not been on a qualified census tract for a long time. Um, and so this site, I mean, it's down in Southwest Alma. It's higher incomes, we're not gonna, it's not gonna become one. But what is frustrating is you get 
more, it's a funding incentive to be in a qualified census tract, but that also means that in a community like Longmont, that means the incentives for to build affordable housing are where the incomes are already low, which does make sense in one aspect, but in another aspect it's concentrating instead of dispersing throughout town. So it makes uh, projects a super challenge anywhere outside of the Main Street corridor. Um, Ascent is not in the qualified census tract, which is why we had to fundraise for the ECA ourselves. If it was in a qualified census tract, then the ECE would have been covered on a taxpayer basis. So there would be, other than services that directly impact the residents on, on site, if we brought in anything that's more of a community impact, like hope or anything like that, we would have to bring in another funding source. I like the services base model with the youth, maybe. Mm -hmm. So I think it would give us additional options. Um, and if, especially if youth are underserved in our community, you know, obviously we don't have any of our uh, units. Okay. But this focus strictly on them could be a, a win for us. And I mean, Chaplain might also look upon it pretty favorably as well. Right. We're serving an under, underserved community as well. Mm -hmm. Well, could we also, I mean, we get state funding at all? I mean, that be an option as well? Could we split Fed and state for a project? Mm -hmm. okay. Especially if it's, so this is, if it's targeted towards youth that are either exiting homelessness or, um, or, uh, Foster, foster care, thank you. Then that that is worth talking to DOH. Like, what kind of options are out there for that? Does that qualify as PSH? Um, these are good questions to dig into. If this is the what we're kind of circling the wagons around, and Element will dive into this as well. I know Element already has a relationship with Together. They they brought up the the um, idea of Together two years ago and asked if we would be interested in doing something like that. Is there a way to uh, kind of, it's, is it a railroad village? Who is it down in number? A royal. A royal? A, a royal. A royal. <laughs> They're the ones with the uh, shelter. Yeah. So is there a way to kind of mirror that so that you've got your permit supportive housing folks looking at the next step up, but you're also bringing in the entry level, like the first off the street? We can certainly Option. try. Is that too much funding for us? Funding the shelter is going to be funding the shelter is going to be tough. Um, that's a big price tag with not a lot of sources out there. Yeah. Not a limit the number of units. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I mean, I think you might get a little. It's a heavy lift. I'm not sure that a, a huge concentration. Is the same. So the. Such a double edged sword because this site, we're trying to balance concentration, but it also has no neighbors that have, like, no, nobody spoke out against Zinnia. It's in this isolated little pocket. Now, this land is proposed for development right now, private development. Townhomes. Townhomes. So that will be a challenge. We need to get in there before they do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's different states. I think the greater community does not understand the support of housing, but they yeah. definitely understand what homeless, homeless shelters. Is. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't, I'm not, and I, I think that would be. And getting into shelter talks is much broader than this group. <laughs> that is a big, big group with a lot of um, key input and things like that. So we are a one of the dog in the big wheel. city led project at this point. Exactly. We don't have the funding to yeah, we would just be like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll help manage this project. You guys handle all, you guys meaning city and other partners related in the in the world of sheltering. Um, we'll get the, get the units built, the LHA, get the units built. You come in with this. It would still be a big partnership and we would still be involved just like we are in all of our partnerships, but it certainly is not LHA running a shelter. So, still an idea. 
it would probably take more time because they would have to do a lot of community building and a lot of funding work. They would have to, there's a, it's a much bigger process to bring a shelter than the would have to get services. So you're talking about how it could be, at the very beginning, aspirational almost for, you know, people coming to the shelter and seeing that there's, you know, paths forward. Could you imagine any these talks go on, like, concrete ways that a shelter like that would, uh, you know, however it's being managed, not by LHA, I understand that, but um, set up some sort of program or even just conversations about getting people from there into the units? Oh, yeah. So it would be something that was some formal structure about that or a formal application process or whatever, or even just a goal that they're looking at. Yeah, we would certainly have case management that would help usher that that's okay. the that's the, the ideal is to have this cap graduation okay. so I'm hearing there's still interest in youth plus services still shelters on the table as a path of interest graduation factor so does that mean that shelter plus traditional I mean we can't it's a it's a target population we can't deny somebody unless it comes with a, if, unless there's a specific voucher out there for youth, which I don't think there is. <laughs> that would be level. smart. I feel like there is, because when I went to a grand opening for um, maker housing, mm -hmm. that they had yeah. specific youth vouchers. Yeah? Yeah, and these are our vouchers for them. And, and then you, can, you can't deny that you can target services as a right. way with student yeah. vouchers to and one way is very one. You, you build the building just like we're building a cent to be family friendly, but we're not going to turn away someone without a family. You can do the same for. I okay. Yeah, they get the voucher for a number of years, and then they can extend it for like two years. Yeah. Up until twenty five. Yeah, so it's like eighteen, and then it's two years. You can go up to age twenty five. And I'm sure together has got this. I do think Element is, they've got their hands full at the moment. So I think once Zinnia's lease up is well underway, then they'll be ready to start digging in. Not yet. We don't have to yet. It doesn't extend to the end, of, it doesn't expire to the end of 2025. Oh, okay. It's just that. If they're going to exercise the option, they have to start planning out. So. Okay. Thanks for the feedback. There'll be more to come. This is just a solidify a brainstorming. Let's see what routes to start with digging into. Okay. So number seven, resident quality of life. Uh, a is emergency procedures. Do you want to table this? Because I know. I was going to propose it okay. because I pulled our emergency procedures yeah. from 2012. Yeah. It doesn't even have Spring Creek and Fall River. It references project management being contracted out to Hudson Company. It is the only thing that's applicable is the floor plans okay. and exit routes. Yeah. So I think, and plus because Arlene yeah, requested Arlene this, I feel like we could bring this back and have a more meaningful conversation. Okay. Um, so clearly, but we will have, we have access to, the city has an entire emergency plan and a whole team that we can dip into to help us make this more meaningful and updated and not a bunch of So I am glad that Arlene brought that up because clearly it is in need of some updates. Okay. All right, that sounds good. And then uh, preparation for affordable home ownership opportunities. So, um, We've, Harold has mentioned this a couple times. It's not an LHA sponsored project. The city 
is sponsoring a, a homeownership new development that's going to be 185 units of which 55 are permanently deep restricted to affordable all for sale um this on the city side we're putting together we're ramping up because we have a portion of the units get to be set aside whether they're in the affordable or the middle income range um get to be set aside for city employees not a preference because the city invested in exchange for that um but then we want to really build up that pipeline the idea is we want those affordable units to have a line out the door um and so the first phase it's been sailing through the entitlements process it's like such a good example of how to work together with the developer to make projects great um, they might be they should be breaking ground on the infrastructure in september and then having their first units for sale next spring like i'm going to say mayish um, and so what we are working on on the city's housing side is a, a process for a lottery system a wait list um, doing our all our pre-qualification stuff working with preferred lenders that would that would be advantageous to you know trying to reduce closing costs and such for these folks that are coming into the affordable units um, and coming up with the down payment assistance program to help people get in as well for those that are under this is all for eight people under 80 percent AMI for those 55 units um, so one pipeline that we want to develop is our residents in LHA properties that are at the higher end of the income range have had successful tenancies and if they're interested in home ownership, affordable, permanently deep restricted home ownership, helping them start the process to get on that list. Um, what that will mean is um, we'll be looking at them with down payment assistance and we've got um, the personal finance counseling resource through Boulder County that the city pays for that we want to get everybody in to those classes and those counseling services to get them prepared for home ownership on the finance side. So I just wanted to ask this group what ideas you might have for us to roll out such a program. Um, you know, our seniors at our senior properties most likely are not going to be the ones interested in this. But we do have families at AMN. We have one family we know of that's that's graduated out and in, on the income side. That that's 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 the ideal is graduate just like the other project we're talking about to the next um, next better housing opportunity. And so I just wanted to run by this group and see if you had any ideas for us as we think about rolling something out. I mean, we could focus on just marketing it to anybody in AMN or anybody on our voucher system too, right? Yeah, <coughs> for sure. Think one aspect of the project would be to help with. We could fund it. This would not be all legit, but almost like a dedicated, not, not a case manager. But someone to help with the process. I mean, I worked in real estate a fairly over, over a decade before I got my first house, and it was a job. Just because you're not, you're thinking as a first time home buyer, not real estate. Mm -hmm. And so it was a lot of document gathering, knowing which questions to ask that people just don't have experience with. And from my experience working with the circles program, people exiting generational or situational poverty, a lot of the basis of that program was just being that support system to help them navigate the systems, going to the bank and opening a bank account. What does that look like? Maybe you've never had a bank account in your entire life. Um, so just providing some like supports for people to rely on and help with would be a great asset to them being successful. So the housing counseling group does do a good portion of that. We also have a dedicated homeowner specialist here. Granted, it won't be all of the buyers at once because that would be way too much. We expect 10 affordable units in the first phase. Um, so it would be you know, spread out over a period of three to five years. Um, so I hope between those two, I think we're gonna identify more, more needs. 
but um, between having a lender that's participating purposefully because they want to, there are lenders in this area that have tried to delve into the first federal membership market and help people. Group? There's cornerstone lending, does the down the uh, start to home program, yeah. Yeah. and then I know there was one more bank that was working on something. I can't recall what it was exactly. They it, it didn't it hasn't fully been rolled out. Um, and then the developer has a lender too that's been working with him on deed restricted stuff, not necessarily affordable, but other deed restricted. Um, so we're gonna get together with them to say what. What do you have in mind um but i think and there's going to be we're trying to figure out um the uh real estate agent relationship as well because that's obviously another piece of the fees at least and um, christy and i started a conversation with um tom kendall at the head company and yeah, title, advantageous title um, fees too. to start the conversation of how do we reduce fees So what we have done is the sales prices for these homes are backed into by um, working on the monthly payment that includes insurance, HOA, private mortgage insurance, all of the add-ons. We have worked backwards on the sales prices to make sure that that price would result in a monthly payment that's still affordable to this income level. Those are so, variable. Like they are, but we are very closely linked. We are funding the heck out of this project. Um, we yeah. are working with them to build the HOA from the start where it would be still sustainable long term. That is one of the, the, the tenets of our partnership with them. Um, so we're talking about Mustang and preparing, trying to do a home ownership prep for some LHA tenants that are yeah. ready, completely ready. Um, so there's there's, it's not fully solid because yes, HOA does have to be there and yes, HOA dues typically increase over time. So what we're trying to do is work with the developer and say, don't make this so much maintenance required that the HOA is gonna be out of this world on the design side. And then we are talking to them like, that is a major concern of ours, making sure this HOA is sustainable long-term. How do we plan for that? Um, so it's not fully answered yet. But that is certainly in mind. I would say from a lending side, there's, um, especially at the bank level, there is a huge push for CRA activities of Community Reinvestment Act. Mm -hmm. And if you're working with a local bank, you can probably get some very tailored programs um, that are specific. And then when you're going through the lender kind of interview due diligence process, I would tell them that you want a dedicated lender that's going to be working with all of the homeowners instead of just, hey, we have a program, but we've got seven different lenders that can help because they'll be able to have a dedicated person that they're, they're always dealing with Molly. Then Molly knows how to navigate and when we get the city ball, and when they send them to home ownership counseling and when they like, do all those pieces in the right order versus um, fumbling their way through. And I would be happy to send you a list of local lenders that I think you could reach out to and say, hey, we want to talk about a dedicated program 
Um, when I was with First Bank, we did that. Mm -hmm. um, we've done it at AB, and so I think that there's probably donations. There's several that I would reach out to that I would say, hey, here's what we're doing, and can you build a program that fits this? Yeah, one of the things on that, <clears throat> sorry, I'm late, I was doing long issues. Um, there's a one bank that has started the home program here locally. I don't know if you've heard of that, where they reduce the fees <clears throat> for lending <clears throat> on anyone that works um, in Longmont to connect it. So <clears throat> we have some of our employees that have used it, but we're not sure where that program is. So we're thinking about that, but definitely trying to be a little more tailored in, in that in terms of establishing a partnership and how we work with each other because that's probably the biggest risk in this is that when more so on the affordable housing side because it doesn't take much for somebody to be qualified and then not be qualified at closing and so those and really the attainment to provide furniture for your house before you close yeah and so understanding and working with those folks is incredibly important so um definitely want to chat with you as we get closer but our hope is to well, i guess while well, i said this especially at amen some of the other properties on the permanently being restricted is to try to get folks moving into that wealth building component where they can so I think the first step is we talk about marketing to HCB tenants and AMN. I mean, we can send it across, uh, across the senior properties as well. We just don't yeah. expect a lot of interest. Um, and then for those that are interested, we could start the personal finance counseling stuff right away. Well, in line with that, I was thinking, you know, for voucher holders and our residents, do we monitor how close they are to maybe exiting or reaching that upper threshold of not qualifying. Yeah. Like if we could really target them. And check their income every year. Right. And I know it's a snapshot in time and obviously right. stuff changes throughout the year and that, but we almost like target them first and even like maybe you, if you have the resources, reach out to them directly and say, hey, you know, right. you consider this and then see if there's yeah. an opportunity for that. I do, I, I wonder if people would be interested off the bat or if it might feel like something that has been unachievable my whole life. I, it feels completely unachievable now. We might have some, some, we might need to do some work to get people thinking that the idea is even possible. And something I brought up before was the PI program at Golden County, personal investment. Um, and I just sent it to you, Erica, so I don't know if you've looked at it before, but Personal investment enterprise where basically a family qualifies for this program, they have to plan to save a thousand dollars a year, and then that money is matched by the county as long as they follow through. And it can be up to five thousand dollars at the end of the program that they can use for a down payment, they can use for education. Um, so if we target people early enough, they can hold that money available for a down payment at the end of the time. And that comes with homeownership education and counseling. It could be a really I think that's the same program. It's, well, there's personal finance, which are just classes. This is something you have to qualify for and stay after them to get the, the matching grant. And they open up a bank account, and then that money gets deposited. I think it's separate from personal finance. I think um, we talked about it before, but Impact Development Fund, I mean, they manage a lot of the down payment assistance programs statewide. Um, and there might already be programs. If you go to their website, they've got a county by county map that shows what down payment assistance programs are out there. Yeah, we know that there's, we have multiple down payment assistance programs we can point people to. We should actually, when we're doing the marketing, list them all. Because we've got the home funded program through the city that's for Boulder County residents. We're going to be taking to council in June 25th a pilot locally funded program. Um, if they're good with that, we'll start doing that together. Well, we kind of started formulating the idea already. And then there are state programs. There are You can get direct um, down payment assistance if you're middle income through the state through a Prop 123 program. And there are other 
ones that are more broad and more local, but we should really include all of those as options. And a lot of them can be stacked. And so when you're marketing to the resident, if you have if you've gone through the lender due diligence phase and said, hey, we would like you to help customize this program, which again, a lot of the local banks will do that because there's such a focus on it, then you can actually give somebody an example and say, look, here's, you know, if you're under this income threshold, you qualify for this, 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 this. This is the number you have to be able to save in order to get that home. And that makes it real for $1,000 The only gripe I have with down payment assistance programs is the city used to call it a, a grant a very long time ago. It wasn't the grant. They took the cost of the grant off of the, the price that they used that we applied to be. So you essentially pay that. It's not a grant. Yeah, they changed that. Else. They changed that since I bought my place in 2014. The other issue I have with DBA is the sign up second mortgage, mm -hmm. which is what I have on the house in Longmont, prevented me from refinancing and getting out of an FHA loan. Because then I would have to, like, if we're going to go that route, and this is my just personal head, this has nothing to do with LJ, but if we're going to go that route with the down payment assistance, I feel like whoever's doing that has to be willing to not get paid off and leave them for refinance, because then. People can reduce their monthly cost if they want to refinance to get a better grade or get rid of mortgage insurance. This FHA loan, you don't just graduate out of mortgage insurance unless you it's have still, a chapter. It's still, it's still charged as it, it's just called something different. Yeah. So unless you have a certain conventional chapel loan where you don't have to put down, you don't have to have 20% equity, like if it's a traditional FHA mortgage, you're going to pay mortgage insurance until you request it or refinance. So. Yeah, silent seconds are kind of a double-edged sword. They're they're good from a perspective of, so those who don't know, the silent piece means that you don't have a repayment during the life of a loan. And doesn't accrue interest. And a lot of times it doesn't accrue interest. Um, so what that means is if you have somebody that's really tight from a qualification standpoint, they can't service that extra amount on a monthly basis, they can't qualify. But what they do then is they structure it so that they get their money back okay. at the end. And sometimes it's like a shared appreciation. So if they provided a 5% down payment, then they get 5% of whatever that appreciation was and that's how they get their revolving loan fund mm -hmm. to operate. But that's the double-edged sword, right? They get 5% at the end and who knows what that number is. So if you calculate an interest rate on that, it could be some huge number. Yeah, I didn't get anything when I sold my house. But you have to balance <laughs> that against what you have, but you couldn't have bought the house to begin with and you had to service that debt. So that's why it's, it's tricky. Yeah. Yeah. And my argument for it is if, if we can reduce the closing costs, because the down payment assistance doesn't actually go to the cost of the home. It, it covers the closing costs mm -hmm. the day of closing and then whatever's left you know goes against the price of the home so they're they're starting with almost no equity to begin with whereas the down payment assistance should be giving them the equity so that's why we started the conference christy and i started the conversation when we were at the bcha with tom of land title how do we reduce the closing costs because it should not cost twenty thousand dollars to close on a home. yeah that's why the start to home program is so important because you know what, it's up, up to what? You get up to like 30, it was $10,000. Like, I've, I've heard of 30000 or so. But, you know, just seeing, you know, we're chasing that program down right now because it's, people still use it, but we're wondering. Underutilized? It's underutilized and maybe finding other banks or something that's willing to replicate what they're doing because they do cut it when we're working. Ten to thirty thousand off of the the closing cost, which then lets the down payment really start to climb to you know the principal on it. But trying to see if we can get other banks to replicate that. Twenty five thousand. Twenty five thousand. It's not nothing. Yeah, no, it's it, it's a pretty. You know, we we've had city employees that have taken advantage of it. It's a big difference. And. You know, I'm someone who benefited from affordable housing. I made, when I sold my condo, I lived good four years. The appreciation is capped at a certain number as 
measured by the city. And I still made twenty thousand dollars when I sold the condo. I didn't think that was going to make anything. That allowed me to pay off the credit card debt after I bought my new home in Longmont for four ninety for the three nine four. That payment was doable. But then when I sold that house four years later, I was able to buy a six hundred and fifty thousand dollar home in Louisville. So it's like it does matter to get people in home ownership. So I thought whatever we can do to help. There's the wealth building aspect, and then there's also just the, the fixed rent costs, right? Like, yeah, the HOA can increase, but there's a fixed, you know what your, your rent's not going to go up 10, 15, 20% per year. You know what your cost is going to be. That's the primary, when you're talking the affordable level, ideally you would walk out with some equity, <coughs> but it is really, a lot of people, it's just to have permanent stability. Yeah. Um, the, the run on insurance is capped if you're, if it's affordable. Because my insurance costs on the condo are much lower than the neighbors who live in non affordable condos. Um, where I think you get into trouble is what you were talking about special assessments being made, which you can get covered by homeowners insurance. Some homeowners insurance offer riders for that. Because I signed up for it when I bought my condo. And then our. In theory, we shouldn't have any, any mechanical issues within the first year of warranty. But if they stay there for five years and they have to replace their roof because of a terrible hailstorm, which is a real thing, they might not have $2,000 to put those out. They have a huge snow year, so snow and we're both $1,000 in the so some kind of revolving loan fund for those homeowners would be nice. Well, I guess yeah. yeah, my only concern with this is, like you mentioned earlier, that you can't refinance possibly, right? Well, you like, can. You can't. Okay, I was just saying, with mortgage rates being so high as they are right now, I mean, there's got to be. The problem is if you have that silent second you mortgage. Have a silent section. And the requirement is that you have to pay that back okay. in order to refinance. So we've written in our DPA program that we're the locally funded that one that we are just formulating, but the repayment often is only if you're doing cash out refinance. If you're refinancing for a lower rate, for a lower rate we don't require it back. If it's a reverse mortgage, because you're trying to stay housed, we don't always require that back either. Yeah. It's really only if you're doing cash out. Yeah. And it doesn't, it's not free to refinance, which was my argument was like, well, why am I going to bother refinancing? I have a decent rate and I'd have to pay off this $20,000 loan. It's going to cost me $3,000 to do it. Financially, it doesn't make sense. Homeowner in that situation might not know that. Yeah, I think part of it, I mean, we're still in the front end of this, but uh, the developer and I talked a little bit about. Considering, I mean, we've always been doing this too. We think we're going to do a lottery. Because gonna be so many people, there's going to be so many people that are interested, but then, you know, I really think if, I, if we could get, you know, one or two lenders, then we could do something to have them come in and structure what we want on the front end for them to compete because. We know there's value based on, you know, you mentioned, I forgot what the program is, the requirements that the lenders have to, to get it in terms of who they're providing the CRA. 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 Yeah. We know there's value to it, and if we could take 188 homes and say, you each get 94 and, and structure a program with a couple of lenders we think we can I think we can probably get something pretty balanced and stable for the people who are buying it. Um, and that's probably what we're gonna start when we get the, the final or planning step tonight. <coughs> then we're starting to, to bring these other components together. And um, operationally from a HOA perspective, I've got to go. I think I'm going to have to go back to the planning commission. Um, but the operational costs are lower because we reduced 
green space would reduce so many different components on that that from a broader sustainability perspective, the traditional cost of the HOA would be lower because you don't have as much to maintain. And that's part of that more urban urbanized development standards because we realize that's a costing too. And on that note, it's really about balance. Like we're not trying to take away green space because that's also beneficial for residents, especially in affordable housing communities, you know, to not have opportunities for green space. But it's more thoughtful green spaces, not necessarily landscape strips mm -hmm. and the, the stuff that's not necessarily used. Yeah. Not, um, not my neighborhood where I have acres and acres of green space. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly doing some water as well. Okay. All right, let's go to LHA reports, uh, operational updates. So I'll take this one. Um, I hate to looking at this form every month and talking about it, because a lot doesn't change given our month units, and I recognize that. Um, but I will say <laughs> we are getting much better at working through our wait list to fill units. Um, we did open our wait list for Briarwood to get two of those units rented out. Uh, and we are actively working through the wait list at Village on Main to start filling units where that are going to be vacant after everyone has moved back in and or transferred to a different unit because uh, we've been holding those pending recent vacation. Um, you can see we have no vacancies at a couple of properties. Most of the vacancies are from people moving out or meth. Um, working through the meth issues, which are always hard given funding. Um, one thing I would say is that we are not having converse, coffee conversations at um, Aspen Meadows this week. Aspen Meadows Senior, we're just a little strapped on staffing and capacity. Um, so I, I've rescheduled center with people, which is center for people with disabilities to come next month because they were coming to all our property in May. So we're already taking care of that. And um, John's working on alerting the residents. Um, but it's kind of a business as usual. Um, for a lot of the properties, you can, I won't read the property updates to you, um, you can keep them, but um, you know, we do have a lot going on. We are actively recruiting and about to start interviewing for the assistant manager positions. Um, with John accepting the position at Fall River Spring Creek after Greg's um, departure, we now have an assistant manager position open that was his, and then we're starting to look for the assistant manager that will work with John at the Sweet Sins and Neil when that comes on. Um, so we're hoping to have interviews next week for that. Um, we got some great options. We also have a new maintenance tech who's starting May 17th or the 20th, which we're going to let him start date. Um, he comes from, uh, his, he had his own company doing construction and we're at home building and that and he has a degree in civil engineering, so it brings a lot of great knowledge. Um, we're excited to have him start. We don't have much else to report based on the voluntary compliance. Mm -hmm. We're waiting for Briarwood. We submitted everything to HUD um, in April 1st, and we have not heard anything yet. Um, yes. Which is, yes. I did, we did just complete, so um, the LHA board is considering an add on to the CDBG grant to do accessibility improvements. Um, city is considering it tonight, LHA will consider it next Tuesday. Um, but we've got the first project is done. Uh, we got the handrails done at the Briarwood. Uh, so we had, we did a massive new ADA ramp and, but then because of the new ramp configuration, we needed handrails. So um, we're still working through those capital improvements and that being the first new one. So those were installed last Friday. Um, so just gonna be working through those grant funds for the next year. Yeah, so I'll just jump in real quick on the operational report. Um, I'm incredibly glad, I'm happy that we filled the position and that more is in position. So we are, I mean, we're starting to get and deal with the issues that, frankly, we never had time to deal with. Um, and, and sort of always dealing with dealing with the tyranny of the moment. So some things that really occurred um, as we're looking at it, you know, one of the first shifts was moving maintenance, sort of maintenance reports to Lauren. 
um, really um, already starting to see some changes in that in terms of um, you know, turnaround on certain issues and with Patrick filling that position, um, you know, really being getting into the, the minutia and making sure the turns are occurring faster, um, working on um, something that we've been asking for, but really getting you know daily logs in terms of what we're doing um, from a maintenance standpoint, and then we started talking about transitioning into the yardy so that we can actually have uh, all the work orders and maintenance in the system versus separate and apart. So, so just in that arena, I think, you know, what we wanted to fill in the position with the assistant director, we're really getting it and then some because <coughs> we're moving faster on some things that we wanted to do. I think when we just start looking generally at, at more of the minutia and the operating areas, uh, we're definitely seeing some different things and dealing with those things, but it's it's really um, starting to move faster actually uh, because of the work and the ability and the attention to detail that was just you know difficult for all of us under the working in the tyranny of the moment and, and dealing with the crisis points. I mean, that being said, the crisis points still develop and we're still dealing with it, but I think. It gives us the ability to parse it in a way that we weren't able to, where everybody can kind of take their components and work it versus having to completely divert to a crisis moment and then we start getting the hot of everything else. And so, um, really happy with, with where we are in, in this position. Um, I know Kendra and I were talking about this yesterday, we were looking at filling it up this year next year just because of things we were seeing accelerated it. And I'm um, definitely glad that that happened. And um, I think you know, we're going to see a lot more coming out of it. So does Briarwood have two units to have for them? I think I need to check with Patrick on those. We had, we did scramble to get two of them ready to go because we're leaving money on the table. Um, I don't know if the two meth units that are outstanding are waiting on extensive work. Um, I think the two that are available are ones that just needed cleaning and that was done. Um, so I need to check with them on those two. <coughs> And that's one of the changes that relatively new. So instead of meth units residing within like the regional property manager position in Lisa, we need maintenance of that because that's really the making and Patrick needs to be involved in ensuring that you know, I just think it's a better fit there. And I, now it makes sense to do it. And we're just actively filling right away now, right? We're yeah, just, we just opened the waitlist. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, from executive director. Well, that was a big part of my update, but I just jumped in on the operational piece. <laughs> Things are just, slowly getting better. Just seeing that. I think, you know, so the thing that's coming at us right now is um, trying to make sense of what came out of this legislative session because there was a lot of legislation that was really dropping around housing, um, transportation, um, and, and those issues starting to morph together. So, um, and when you think about it, really think about it in terms of transit oriented development. So on uh, Senate Bill 184, obviously that was the legislation on um, that related to rail, Northwest Rail, Front Range Passenger Rail, and uh, that really kind of set the clock on what that's going to look like, and you know at least for Northwest Rail, rail or the northern part of FRPR, saying they wanted to have that operational within five years. So kind of mark that as the transportation. Associated with all of that is um, a lot of items related to housing um, in transit 
in, in transit or areas, transit oriented development. And and I think from a housing authority's perspective, it's gonna cause a little bit it's gonna cause we're gonna need to refocus because there's a lot of money sitting at the state, whether it's how they're looking at Prop 123 or how they're looking at um, some other components and really utilizing those funds to build housing in transit areas. Uh, and so for us, and the, the, the piece is you're seeing housing authorities mixed in a lot of this a lot of these programs where they want them involved in transit oriented development. So I think globally the theory is is that if you have a transit station and you have bus and you have rail and in Longmont's case <coughs> and you have micro transit is it makes more sense to have affordable and I'm gonna announce today attainable housing in areas associated with transit because you reduce the operating costs for the family units because then they don't have to buy multiple vehicles or any vehicles because it's sort of in that area. So as we as we look at this, um, I think for us when we look at future projects, transit-oriented development is probably going to be the key for us just because that's how we're going to leverage our funds. Um, and Molly, I think the past, I think the legislation on <clears throat> Chaffa and the middle income pounds too. Mm -hmm. So now we're seeing that starting to drop into the equation and, and really just thinking about how this all works in the long run. So obviously for us, that's going to be the area of primary focus is going to be uh, first in Maine and that steam area and near South Main Station and, and how that's going to work. Um, we're already looking at a project that I think we talked to you all about it. It was in the Middle Income Housing Authority program. That program is, has its own issues. And so we'll probably kind of be coming back with the advisory board and the board, um, Housing Authority board itself to kind of talk through some opportunities in this project that really could set a different course for the housing board. Um, in that case, and I'm being incredibly vague, because I'm probably going to need to set a joint executive session for both of these groups um, to talk through the nuance and the details on this project. Um, but before we do that, um, we're trying to schedule meetings with um, financial advisors, so municipal government and financial advisors, um, you know, people who will um, sort of either sell or bid the debt to understand really what the parameters are and what the capacity is for the housing authority to jump in and do something like this and essentially become an owner utilizing governmental fin financing mechanisms that, you know, generally the ROI, um, let's say around here, eight starts spinning off, could theoretically spin off about a million dollars a year um, in revenue, plus you've got the equity in the project, and could allow you to then use the equity that you have to then potentially do another type of deal like this in another transit-oriented area, which then starts tying into, from the city side, uh, the Main Street redevelopment goals that the council set for us, especially one thing. And, and so, a lot of moving pieces, but I think we really need to dig into some of this legislation. But um, I did want to get it on in your minds that we may have to schedule an executive session and that would probably be an evening that we have the Housing Authority Advisory Board meeting that's starting like at 5 30 if people can work better than just that. Just to add on both the tax credit uh, 
propositions went forward. Not propositions, the legislation went forward. So expanding the existing low income housing tax credit and creating the new income housing tax credit. I know the the eviction legislation went forward. It, there was a fair amount of amendments um, associated with it that it's not as bad as it was. It's not, it's not great, <laughs> but, um, and um, that, so that was something that, again, we're going to have to wrap our minds around a little bit. And then what else? There's another one. What the one about the renewing the lease? Yeah. That's the, that that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's the one. It's for cause eviction. Right. Okay. Yeah. I heard that there was a case from us in Boulder on Friday where it was, you know, eviction was being challenged by the defendant against that law, the new law. You know, I've heard that. Heard that. that. Okay. Yeah. Check on that. I, I didn't. Do probably the first case on that last week. I went, I went to trial, and the judge ruled that there was no reciprocal um, part of the law. So the law took effect on the 19th of April or something. Mm -hmm. So anything that was filed before that could still move forward. I know there's a heated debate between the, the attorney general and all of that. I've been looking into it too, and I, I, I can't find where the application is that the defense attorney is going to do this. But I know we've got the first case that goes, you know, correcting for a few more. That's the transit period of the trend. You know, if it was filed before the 19th of April, the first half of this. Yeah, I mean, I think the people that are probably going to. I mean, what it's going to do, and we talked about it, and we talked about this with the council, where you tended to be more lenient with tenants, you're going to be less lenient and, and, and really have to stay on top of the issues uh, versus uh, before where you could work with them and you could do certain things. This law doesn't give you the luxury to do that. And, and so from a management perspective, you're going to have to be on point from day one to make sure that you're dealing with the issues. And so I think the unintended consequence to, to this is that people who may have, who were landlords, may have worked with them are, are going to be the, vic the victims of this and the unintended consequences because they're going to get them on everything. That's pretty much the general concept. Yeah. It's a messy law, too. Right? Yeah. No more late rent in this way. <laughs> right. No more. I mean, you just can't do it. You just can't do it. You've got to know this on the first that they go, you know, are you going to get them out after? Well, one thing that we're doing, and this is genius because it's not a lot, all of our new leases will be about the most. So any new tenant coming in will be built. It is super smart. I am one of our property management friends like hey, just do all the ones. Oh my god, genius. That's so you've got to you've got to until they fix it. But right now <laughs> <laughs> right now right now, mm -hmm. right now for this current moment, no one gets a twelve. Once you've gone beyond 12 months, there's nothing. I mean, if you, can, if you decide to do them, mm -hmm. you're stuck with it. But at least, like, figuring out who they're going to be. Mm -hmm. I love this. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Lauren, let's mark that or something. Oh, believe me, there's all kinds of conversations about the workarounds, like how you're going to get around this. And if all of those workarounds make it worse, it's probably going to be. Yeah. So now you don't get a, now you're in the zero space, and everyone's in the pot. You don't get a full year. Yeah, that's a piece, right? So what you see in the first 12 months is typically what you're going to deal with. Mm -hmm. and, and where you were more lenient, you just can't be. 
and um, and that gets to you know I think what was and they did make some adjustments in the law regarding the quiet enjoyment of everyone else. To enforce that, like yeah. To figure out how to actually make that small. Yeah. But that's typically the issue that we deal with when we get into this is outside of payments, the majority of issues that we deal with operationally is because the rest of the residents are fussing at us because they're not able to have the quiet enjoyment of the living conditions within a unit because of the actions of another individual. And, you know, it's an interesting conversation that we actually had related to, you know, permanent support of housing and <clears throat> Zinnia is getting real with everyone and talking about is the individual being raised above the living environment for everyone else? Because if that's really the case from an operational perspective, you're all you're creating a no-win situation for the operational side of it because that's where you're in there dealing with the residents and all of these challenges in terms of their living experience based on the actions of another individual. Um, and I think this is just another example of that. So yeah, it's, um, it's going to be um, a bit of diving into it. Um, I just for you all, the ADA, ADU legislation passed. So ADUs um, and the interplay with um, HOAs is, is going to be interesting to see because I think it now allows ADUs um, anywhere. Um, for us as a city, it doesn't make a big difference. And I'm just saying it's good it does. It will, I think, touch housing authority based on vouchers. And as more ADUs get built, people can utilize vouchers there, which is a good thing. I mean, it's a good thing. Um, but for the city side, it doesn't really change anything because we already have ordinances that deal with any use. Um, those ordinances are utilized in primarily areas that don't have HOAs because the HOA companies are actually what's preventing the ADUs from being constructed. And so the game's going to change. So operationally for us, not a big deal. But as the city, for the housing authority, I think that. And, and really for the vouchers generally could balance out cost on vouchers um, as you see more coming online. Um, I think the question is going to be the legal challenges from the HOA side related to the legislation um, and their authority. So we're going to be watching that as well. I don't think you're going to really see new prices out two different properties adding an additional unit of a garage or whatever. And the price to construct is just so high that I just remember doing this season. I will say on the city side, we have intended to roll out an ADU stock plan program. Uh, we have stock plans created. We have not rolled the program out. COVID derailed it and then just general capacity when things changing are over. But we have it. The goal is to out to roll it out. I still think even with that, it's not going to be a giant uptick because construction still is what it is. Yeah. But um, that's why it hasn't been a giant priority in terms of what can we, you know, the impact compared to the lift. Um, but there is there's something coming. You might say a couple of construction. Yeah. Right. You're just not I know it's like the yep. panacea in our mind that all these things are going to be built, but having priced out, price it out, it's just, we can't, we can't return to find our best thing to yeah, I th we think that we're going to see it's more the basement conversions where okay. that may that. be kind of where the first wave starts sliding in because you know, you're not constructing, yeah. you're just redoing the walls and, and things. Like that. So we think that may be where we see it first. But we'll see. 
So we've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, quarter one property budget review. So we have both property and private property, but the two properties that have the biggest that you're back in was Amen and Briarwood, and it's mainly due to the vacant units, the four vacant units. We've already exceeded the annual budget for vacancy dollars on those two properties, so we're going to want to watch those um, continuous, continuously throughout the next three quarters to make sure where, we, where we're going to actually be at. AMN doesn't have any developer fees, so that's a good thing. Um, but um, and neither does Briarwood, so we won't be um, not paying developer fees that were planned throughout the schedule. Um, the other thing would be on the LHA, we are in the negative at the moment, but that is just timing of revenue. Um, we did finally get um, one of our developer fees from the OM, which was 250000 and that hits in April. So that brings us back in the black. Um, so no cause for concern there as well. It didn't have a voucher update, um, but that's because the 2024 two-year tool hasn't come out yet. But we did get our funding increase, and it went 16.44%. We got $961,000 additional to our funding. Um, our vouchers are still on hold at the moment because because the fair market increase was so large, it was like $200 per property per month. We are seeing a significant increase in costs. Landlords are taking advantage of that extra increase because of the tax hit and all of that other stuff. So to kind of give you an idea, we had 426 vouchers and, and we had froze our vouchers to begin with because we're getting ready to map up and provide the PPDs for Village on Main. Um, in January, we had 426 vouchers. In May, we had 416. So we have dropped 10 vouchers between January and May. However, we are increasing in cost. So those 426 vouchers costed $543,000. Our 416 vouchers costed $567,000. So we are, they're taking advantage of it. I'm glad we got an increase because it kind of cushions. Um, and that could be too why we got the increase, but I also think it's because we were voucher enough that they were finally seeing progress um, on the LHA side. Last year we got eight percent, so we did double this year. Um, AR, AR is pretty. So, so on that note, I mean, this is a clear example of why we weren't getting money and why we're now getting money, just because of voucher enough. Um, I did have a conversation. So Congressman McGoose came in, you know, so we got a million dollars for microtransit. Um, and when he was here giving us a scour from check, um, I did have a chance to talk to him about the issues that we're having on the vouchers and the dollar amounts. And, and so over the next probably four months, we're gonna, um, wants us to contact his, his staff and start working with him so he can help us with HUD in terms of the money that we're having. Um, and then um, Senator Bennett was here on a water issue and I had a chance to talk to him and his staff about the voucher components as well. So we're going to start engaging congressionally um, on, on the voucher numbers or the voucher dollars that are coming in. And AR is same old, same old. We have past tenant, we have 15,000 of past tenant balances working through the 30, 60, and 90 day letter process. Um, subsidy timing issues, a lot of the times when we house somebody, it takes a couple months before we actually see the subsidy, even though it's being charged to the tenant ledgers. Um, so we have some issues there. We have about 14,000 um, that we have some subsidy timing issues with. And then just people prepaying rent before it's due. They may pay it at the very end of the month, which it gets recorded, but it's it's really falling off. So it kind of I'll just wait some more. <coughs> but no cause for concern on the letters. That is abnormal. Well, the suites if you compare December to April to over ninety, jump from seven thousand to twenty four thousand. Those are my units. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we're still so we're still like charging rent for those units, yeah. even though we're not getting 
uh, yes. money. Okay. We still charge for them. So we yeah. still we still put all of the costs oh. to that tenant that we are incurring okay. to rebuild that unit. Okay. Um, partly to and a lot of it, what what's going to happen is going to get written off right. okay. because it's going to go through the thirty day sixty. It's going to get sent to collections, mm -hmm. and then we'll obviously that we haven't seen any money come back mm -hmm. from collections. Um, but it also helps us to look at those ledgers. Like we just had one recently that you know. What did we do for this individual? What, how did we store their mess, mess up? And we can go back to their ledger and find those transactions. Um, or if they come back to us. Um, when we first started, people were coming back to get housing from us and we didn't know that they had existing problems to begin with when they were housed before because there was nothing on their way to show anything to them. So that's, that's a part of it. But then the other thing is, so, I'm looking, so we, I know we have nothing notes A and that and suites, right? Amen. Yeah, Amen and suites. So those are the over 90s. Then why is Spring Creek over 90s so high as well? You know, 14,000 there. You know why? Um, oh, Spring Creek is, so for this particular one, there is one that's getting written off. This was an individual that went to court. Um, it went all the way to the eviction process and went to well, not just eviction, it went to a trial proceeding. So that's their one individual. And it's it's actually just uh, written off by Carol and it's getting moved to collections. So once that's, I mean, you're going to see that because because of the process, we have to do the 60 day and then day letters, and a lot of the times, they're not getting done in a timely fashion, so it's taking us a little longer to get those balances and other reflections in right on. Um, it was left off the agenda that the folks like you made a small thing. Um, security still rolling, still doing very well. We've got again some issues with properties, um, and they've now moved forward with just being at the suites. Um, and so, yeah, organizing weekends. Um, camera update is that it sounds like our contract's almost completed. Um, waiting to get back from purchasing to see if we can just use our money that we need to use by October and to purchase the equipment on that way we're all set and ready to roll and the contract is signed for the company that's going to be able to install. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have our biannual crime free training next uh, Wednesday, the 22nd. So if anyone would like to go together, let me know I can send you the That's all I have. And actually, this is crazy. Knock on some wood. We have no calls for service at any of the properties from Friday until last night and three morning. Mother's Day. Uh, someone that wanted yeah, to be able to voluntarily have a mental health mm -hmm. suites. I, I did see something like Mother's Day is the lowest. If you can tell us if this is true, the lowest crime day of the year. Because all the mothers are busy. That well, we and didn't joke about that. Exactly. That was a joke. The mothers are too busy to go through it. Well, maybe at LHA properties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got the Super Bowl was the lowest crime day of the year right now. I thought it was the highest for domestic violence. That in bar fights. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, any other business? <laughs> All right, let's adjourn.